Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with broccoli soup au gratin. That's right, I was eating some French onion soup a while back, and I thought to myself this beautifully brown cheesy crouton would probably be fantastic on other soups, like broccoli for example. So I decided to give it a try, and what followed was exciting and educational, but also upsetting and confusing. So I don't want to give too much away, but let's just say you have a surprise ending to look forward to. All right, so that should hold you. And in the meantime, we'll go ahead and get started, the same way we start almost all soup recipes, by sauteing a diced onion with some salt in melted butter over medium heat until it starts to soften up and turn translucent, which will take you, I don't know, about five or six minutes. But as usual, forget about the time. Just cook those onions stirring until they soften up and sort of look like this. And once that happens, we can go ahead and toss in a couple cloves of minced garlic, and we'll cook that stirring, but only for about a minute. Okay, as usual, we don't want any color on that garlic. So we will saute that garlic in the onions for about 60 seconds, at which point we can go ahead and dump in our cooking liquid, which in my case is gonna be chicken broth. Or if you're going vegetarian here, of course you can use veggie stock, whatever that is. And once that's in, what we'll do is raise our heat to high because we need to bring this up to a simmer before we add our broccoli, which ideally we will prep while waiting for our liquid to come up to a simmer. And what follows is my preferred method for cutting this for soup. All right, what I like to do first is kind of cut off all those florets, since that part of the broccoli cooks a lot faster than the stem. So what I'll do is trim those off, and then possibly cut some of those in half, if the stem's still a little big. And then once that's set, we can turn our attention to the much tougher, much thicker stem part, which I like to have and then quarter, before cutting up in fairly small pieces. In this way, the flower portions of the vegetable aren't going to be way, way overcooked by the time the stem's tender. And I continued on using that method until I had about three pounds of trim broccoli, which is about a pound more than I usually use for this soup. But because I was going to finish this au gratin style with that cheesy crouton, I thought it would be a lot better if I made the soup thicker. But anyway, once our broccoli is prepped, assuming our stock has come to a simmer, we can go ahead and transfer that in. And I do realize it looks like I have way too much vegetable and not enough liquid, but it's actually okay. Because what I'm going to do with this on high heat is cover it and let it cook for a couple minutes like that until the broccoli kind of softens up a bit, and we can really see what we have. So that's what I did, and a few minutes later it looked like this, and I could tell I had just enough liquid. And of course if you don't, you can add a splash. But I determined this to be fine. And what we'll do is reduce our heat to medium low, and simmer that, stirring occasionally, for about 10 minutes or so, or until that broccoli is very tender. So this is me about 10 minutes later, checking things out. And I could kind of tell just by stirring it, it was fine. But as you know, we always like a second opinion. So I grabbed a fork and gave it the old polka polka, and determined yes, it was in fact tender. Which means we can turn off the heat and blend this completely smooth. Which I'm going to do with a stick blender. But of course, doing it in batches in a traditional blender will work beautifully. Okay, so that took me a few minutes. But eventually I got that nicely pureed. And what we'll do once that's been accomplished is go ahead and add the rest of the ingredients. Which will definitely include a nice big splash of heavy cream, as well as we'll do a little touch of freshly grated nutmeg which is very traditional in a cream-based soup, and there's probably a really good reason for that. We will also do some freshly ground black pepper, as well as the customary shake of cayenne, and then last but not least, a very generous application of salt. And then what we'll do at this point is go ahead and stir that in, while simultaneously returning that to medium-low heat. And as soon as we're confident our soup is nice and hot again, we can go ahead and serve it, but not before tasting for seasoning. And by seasoning, I mostly mean salt. All right, generally the difference between a good vegetable soup and a great vegetable soup is like a teaspoon of salt. So we're gonna to need to taste this and almost certainly add some more salt. And once our soup is tasting exactly like we want and it's come back to temperature, we're pretty much ready to serve. But before we do, we're gonna to need to make some nice crispy buttered croutons, which I'm gonna do in the oven by buttering both sides of a couple pieces of stale bread. And once those slices have been sufficiently slathered, we'll go ahead and pop those into a 375 degree oven until they're nicely browned and crispy. Okay, we want those pretty much cooked all the way through. So those are looking just about perfect right there. And then once our croutons are done and our soup is ready, we can move on to final assembly. So I'm gonna use the same pan we did our croutons on, and we will fill up some oven-proof crocks, probably the same ones you use for French onion soup. And we will fill those almost, but not quite to the top, because of course we have to leave room for our crouton, which almost fit in, but I had to do a little trimming. But that's okay, we can put those trim pieces along the side. And then once our crocs have been croutoned, we'll go ahead and add our grated cheese over the top. And I'm doing a blend that's like one-third Gruyere cheese and two-thirds sharp cheddar. And it looks like I'm being super generous with the cheese, 
But you'll see, this actually melts down to a pretty thin layer. So if you want to put a little more and be even more generous, go ahead. You are, after all, the Dan Fouts of your cheese amounts. But anyway, that looked like a good amount to me. And then what we'll do once our crocs have been croutoned and cheesed is transfer those under the broiler for approximately five to six minutes or until our cheese is beautifully browned and bubbly. And because it's pretty common for broilers to have hot spots, I do like to rotate mine after a few minutes. But unfortunately, my oven turns off if I open the door, so I can't show too much of this scintillating footage. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and finish those under a hot broiler until they look a little something like this. Check it out. Man, do those look good. And I could not wait to grab a spoon and get into that. And since we don't need to let these rest, that's exactly what I did. After scattering over a few chives, and I was so excited as I took this first spoonful, which seemed really, really thick. Like I was trying to make it thick, but this was like really, really, really thick. I think partly because it sat for a few minutes while I took pictures, and that crouton sucked in some of the moisture. But also I think that it was just way, way, way too thick. And when I started eating it with the bread, or at least attempting to, I quickly realized this is terrible. This is not good at all. all right, instead of making broccoli soup all gratin, I'd accidentally made wet broccoli bread pudding. And no one's ever walked into a restaurant thinking, man, I hope they have wet broccoli bread pudding today. So at this point, I was very disappointed and upset and borderline despondent. So it was clear I had failed spectacularly. But there was no way I was going to let the food win. So having determined the main problem was the soup being too thick, I tried doing another crock, but before I did, I thinned out the soup and passed it through a fine strainer, which not only made this thinner, but significantly improved the texture. And once I'd ladled in my new and improved soup, I went ahead and topped it with the crouton and the cheese as usual. And while it came out pretty much looking the same, it was way, way better, like night and day. Right, by doing a thinner soup, the contrast between that cheesy crouton and creamy liquefied broccoli was way more successful, which isn't saying much because the other one was really terrible. But I actually really did enjoy this, and I felt a lot better that I didn't give up. Of course, appearance-wise, we still have a problem since as soon as you try to eat some of the toast, it still disappears below the surface. But I have an idea to fix that also. By cutting up our bread next time and doing smaller square croutons, then topping it with the cheese, so that we can eat it spoon by spoon without wrecking the whole raft. So that's what I'm going to do next time, if there's a next time. But anyway, that's it. The epic saga of my broccoli soup all gratin comes to an end, with a relatively happy ending. So I really do hope you give this a try soon, with a much thinner soup, and maybe a bunch of small croutons instead of one big one. But either way, head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Charred broccoli beef. That's right, we're burning broccoli. Except this time we're doing it on purpose. And that's just going to be one of two major tweaks we do to this Chinese American takeout favorite. And I know this is two broccoli videos in a row. But I've wanted to share this for a while, and it has absolutely nothing to do with my secret need to redeem myself when it comes to working with broccoli. All right, fine. That is the actual reason. And now that I've confessed to that, we can go ahead and get started. With the second major tweak to this recipe, how we prep and cook the beef. And this will work with all kinds of different cuts, but what I have here is one pound of skirt steak, which is generally sold trimmed and ready to use. And I know it still has a little bit of fat on there, but a little bit of that white surface fat is totally fine, if not desirable. So I'm going to be working with this as is. And what we're going to do to prep this is cut it in half first, so it fits into the pan a little easier. And then we're going to go ahead and season both sides very generously with kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper, as well as some cornstarch. Not a ton, but enough to lightly coat the surface. And we are definitely going to do that to both sides. And in case you didn't know, how this is normally done is the raw meat is sliced into thin strips. Then the cornstarch and seasoning is applied before all those thin slices of beef are quickly stir-fried in a wok or other ridiculously hot pan. And if you're in the right conditions, that is a fantastic method. But I think the following approach is going to work better for the home cook. Because what we're going to do is sear the meat like this, let it cool, and then slice it thin. That way we know we have browning on every piece, as well as it's going to be a lot easier to control the doneness. So anyway, like I said, we're going to season and starch both sides, at which point we can move to the stove where we're going to sear this over high heat and a little bit of vegetable oil for about, I don't know, three or four minutes per side, or until that surface is beautifully brown and crusty and the meat's cooked to around a medium rare. So that's what I did, gave it about three or four minutes per side until it looked a little something like this, at which point we're going to transfer that to a plate to cool and cool completely. All right, that's why we did this step first. 
So we'll go ahead and leave that on the plate till it cools completely. At which point you can slice it, or even better, pop it in the fridge until it's really cold, and then slice it, which works even better. Okay, but either way, we are going to cook and cool our beef ahead of time. And while we're waiting for that, we might as well go ahead and mix up our sauce, which is going to start with a few spoons of oyster sauce. Ooh, check it out. So dark, shiny, and mysterious. Which is probably why you should Google it. All I know is it's kind of sweet and is made with an oyster extract. And then to that, we're going to add some sherry wine, because I'm assuming you don't have Chinese cooking wine. And as you know, any dry sherry is going to work here, except one's labeled cooking sherry. And that's literally the only one you don't want to use. I know that is ironic, and we'll touch on that in the blog post. But for now, let's continue with a little bit of soy sauce, as well as a little touch of ketchup, which I'm putting in for some color and acidity. I always feel like I have to explain myself when I use ketchup. And then we're also going to need a little bit of stock. I'm using chicken, but beef will also work here. And then last but not least, we'll whisk in a little bit of cornstarch, which will of course thicken our sauce at the end. And by the way, another thing I'm going to touch on in the blog post is how you can adjust the amount and thickness of this sauce to your liking. Okay, I tend to go for something that's fairly light, more like a glaze, as opposed to others who may prefer a much thicker sauce and or a lot more of it. So we'll cover all that. But for now, we'll just give that a mix and set it aside while we move on to our last and most important component, our charred broccoli. And what we're going to need is one pound of fresh broccoli florets that have been cut into whatever you consider a bite-sized piece, which is what I think these are. And please don't take this the wrong way, but nobody cares how big you cut your broccoli, as long as they're all about the same size. And that is simply so they cook as evenly as possible. And then the only thing we're going to add here is a couple teaspoons of vegetable oil, which I'm going to drizzle over, and then I'll give these just a very brief tossing by flipping them around in the bowl like this, because I'm a show off. But if you want, just go ahead and mix that up with your hand or a spatula. And then once those have been very, very, very lightly coated with oil, we will transfer those to a foil lined baking sheet, and we'll arrange those in a single layer. And ideally, if possible, have your stems pointing down and your flower sides pointing up. And then what we'll do once that's set is transfer that into a 500 degree oven for about 10 to 12 minutes or until our broccoli starts to char. And if you're thinking, why would you burn broccoli? That's going to taste terrible. Well, you would think, but it doesn't. It makes it taste amazing. And even though we have some decent color on those, the stems are still fairly firm, which is fine because this is going to get cooked a little bit in our sauce when we finish. So these were just about perfect but I did want a little more color on them. And we could just pop those back in the oven for three or four more minutes. But another possibly quicker method would be to pop these under a hot broiler for just a minute to finish our charring. So that's what I did. And a minute later, they look like this. So if you need to pop yours under the broiler for a little bit, go ahead. You are, after all, the David Carr of how far to char. So as you can see, I got a little more charring on the flour. And yet, as I said, our stems still have a little firmness to them. And then what we'll do once that's set, assuming our meat is cold, is go ahead and slice it up using a very specific technique. So what we're going to do first is find the grain, which is really easy with skirt steak. Okay, we can see those meat fibers are running this way. And what we'll do is cut that in two or three pieces with the grain, meaning in the same direction as the fibers. And then, double checking we're going the right direction, we will slice each of those pieces against the grain in the thin slices, I don't know, about an eighth of an inch. And by slicing it this way, you ensure very tender, easy to chew pieces. All right, skirt steak is very, very delicious. But if you were to cut these slices with the grain, you would have to chew each piece from between seven and 10 minutes. So we'll go ahead and slice up our meat in nice bite-sized pieces, making sure we're going across the grain. And then once that's set, we can move into final assembly and put all these components together. So we'll go ahead and move back to the stove. And yes, as you may have noticed, I'm using the same pan I used to cook my steak. And we will add a little touch of vegetable oil into which we will transfer our minced garlic. And you'll also notice I started this off cold. All right, I like to add my garlic and then turn on the heat. All right, since the only way at this point to screw this up would be to overcook the garlic. So if we toss it into smoking hot oil, there is a danger it can go too far. But with that pan coming up to temperature slowly, it is way, way easier to manage. So we'll simply wait for the pan to get hot and for our garlic to start sizzling, at which point we're only going to cook it for about 30 seconds. Okay, like I said, we don't want any color. And I know, it looks like it has a little color, but that's actually from the leftover meat juices in the pan. And then what we'll do once that's sizzled for about 30 seconds is go ahead and transfer in our beef along with any accumulated juices. We will also go ahead and toss in our recently charred and still relatively firm broccoli, as well as our sauce mixture. And we will go ahead and stir all that together. And once we have all our components in the pan, finishing this is very, very easy. Because all we're gonna do is cook this on medium high, stirring occasionally, until everything's heated through, 
and our sauce thickens up a little bit. And again, let me remind you, I'm not using a lot of sauce here. I just like enough sauce to sort of coat it like a glaze. Well, actually, that's not true. I like a ton of sauce and way thicker, but I thought I'd do a slightly healthier version. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and keep stirring and cooking until our broccoli heats through and those stems get just barely tender, as well as, of course, our beef heats through and our sauce thickens up. And once that's all been accomplished, we are ready to serve up on some rice. Although, as usual, it's not a bad idea to taste your sauce and maybe a piece of broccoli and beef, just in case you have to adjust your seasonings, maybe add another splash of soy. But I determined mine to be perfect, so I went ahead and served it up. And by the way, the reason we charred the broccoli was for flavor, but I also love what it does to the appearance, since it kind of keeps that dark green color. It doesn't really turn gray like your traditional broccoli beef recipe. But anyway, we'll go ahead and serve that up and finish it with an extra spoon or two of sauce. As well as I decided a little shake of cayenne. I thought a little heat would be nice, but also I love how that warms up the color. So I finished up with a little bit of cayenne, and that's it, our charred broccoli beef is ready to enjoy. So let me go ahead and grab a fork and dig in. Yes, the chopsticks were just for the picture. But anyway, no matter what you use, if you are a fan of the broccoli beef, I think you're going to love this version. I mean, no sane person actually gets excited eating broccoli. But this is probably as close as you're ever going to get. Right, that little bit of char might seem crazy, but the bitterness really brings out the sweetness in the vegetable. And as far as our beef goes, while it's not going to have the exact same texture as you're used to from those takeout places, it's going to be very flavorful, very tender, and because of how we prepped it, still very juicy and not dry. But anyway, that's it, charred broccoli beef. Before I sign off, I should apologize to your friendly local neighborhood Chinese takeout place, who I assume will experience a significant decrease in broccoli beef sales. But despite that, because this is so easy and delicious, I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Three cheese broccoli manicotti. That's right, you're in the mood for some cheesy, saucy Italian comfort food. But you're also trying to keep that promise to yourself to eat healthier and include more green vegetables. Which is why I'm so excited to share this easy stuffed pasta recipe, since we can do both. So yes, this is a compromise, but it's still a very delicious and satisfying one. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with a tutorial on how to prep broccoli. And I think what we should do first is cut off the tougher, more fibrous stems, and then we'll go ahead and slice those lengthwise like I'm doing here. And by separating the flowery parts from the stems, we can treat this as two different vegetables with two different cooking times, since when you cook broccoli all together, those florets will always be overcooked by the time the stems are tender. And by the way, if any of the tops have like a thick stem attached, we can cut those in half. And then what we'll do once that little bit of knife work's done is head to the stove, and we will transfer the stems only into some generously salted boiling water. And we will boil those for three to four minutes to give them a head start. And then once those pieces are just starting to get tender, we will go ahead and add those much faster cooking tops. At which point we'll cook all this another three to four minutes. Or until everything is just barely tender. And I mean just barely. Okay, it shouldn't be tough and raw and crunchy. But we don't want this soft either. So somewhere right in between. And that's it. Once we've reached that point of parboiled broccoli perfection, we'll go ahead and transfer that to a bowl of cold water, which will cool these down and immediately stop the cooking. And then after we let those sit in the water for a couple minutes, we'll transfer those to a colander to let them drain very, very, very well. Okay, we want this broccoli to be as dry as possible when we chop it. So we'll set that aside and let it drain thoroughly. And while that's happening, since we already have boiling water that's salted and flavored with broccoli, Let's go ahead and cook our pasta tubes, which we will do for about six to seven minutes, or whatever your package directions say, which will not be fully cooked and ready to eat. But don't forget, these are gonna get baked with our sauce and cheese, so we do want these undercooked a bit. Oh, and I forgot to mention, do not throw away that bowl of cold water we used to shock our broccoli, since once our pasta is cooked, we will transfer it into that. And yes, yeah, sometimes one of these tubes will break open, but we only need 12, and they usually come 14 to a package, so that's fine, you can actually break two if you want. And once transferred in, we'll simply let our tubes sit in that cold water until we're ready to use them. And yes, you can drain these into a colander and then put them back in the pot and fill that with cold water. But I think this is easier and there's less chance of breakage. And then assuming our broccoli is very, very well drained, we'll go ahead and transfer that to our cutting board and chop it up into small pieces, which I like to do by hand since it only takes about two or three minutes. 
But you can also pulse this on and off in a food processor, which of course is way faster, but then you gotta clean that, and your broccoli will almost always end up too finely chopped. So I suggest working this over with a knife for a couple minutes, until we end up with something that looks like this. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I am prepping extra here. All right, we only need three cups of this stuff chopped for the recipe, but I'm gonna prep everything I have so I have some extra for other recipes. Maybe for a salad or some fried rice. Oh yeah, that sounds good. And then to that we will add some finely minced or crushed garlic, along with some beautiful full fat ricotta cheese. Although I guess technically you can use the lower fat version. I mean, you are after all the fat boy slim of using the partially skim, but I want the richest, most delicious ricotta I can find. And then for our second and third cheeses, I'm gonna do some grated provolone, which could if you want be mozzarella, but provolone has a lot more flavor, so I go with that. And then our final cheese will be the lovely and talented Reggiano Parmesan. But if you don't want it to taste as good, you can use the fake stuff if you want. And that's it, we'll finish our filling up with a couple whole large beaten eggs, plus some kosher salt, a few shakes of cayenne, some freshly ground black pepper, and then last but not least, a little bit of freshly grated nutmeg, which is about 10 to 20 times better than the nutmeg that comes already ground. And that's it, once we've nutmegged our cheese filling, which by the way has a much different meaning in basketball. But anyway, once everything's in there, we'll go ahead and take a spoon and give this a mix. And we will keep mixing until we're 100% sure everything's been thoroughly combined. At which point we can pop that in the fridge to keep it cold until we need it. Which brings us to our last component, the sauce. And what I have here is our favorite prepared pasta sauce. And what I like to do here is add a few cups of water, and then we'll bring this up to a simmer on medium high heat. And you don't have to, but the reason I'm thinning my sauce out is because I like to bake my manicotti in the sauce, and I don't want it to dry out and get too thick while that happens. So this is my very wet method. If you want to use a drier method, go ahead. And then what we'll do once our thinned out sauce is hot, we'll go ahead and ladle about a half inch into our largest baking dish, which I'm sure many of us refer to as our lasagna pan, which is what Michelle and I call this. And then besides the sauce, I'm gonna add one optional, but very special important ingredient. And that would be one cooked crumbled up Italian hot sausage, or just like we would prep if we were making pizza. And the reason we're doing it this way and not cooking it in the sauce is because I want sausage in the sauce, but I don't want a sausage sauce, which is what we get if we simmered the sausage in the sauce to begin with. Okay, that's gonna permeate much more than this method. And yes, it does make a difference. And how much of a difference? I have no idea. And in case you're wondering, I call this the secret sausage technique. And that's it, once our pan is sauced and sausaged, we can go ahead and transfer our filling into a piping bag or a plastic bag. And we will cut off the tip slightly smaller than the opening of our tubes, at which point we'll go ahead and fill our pasta up. And fair warning, if you squeeze too much in, these could break. So we do want these filled, but we don't want to overfill them. And yes, you can just use a teaspoon to push this in like my mom and grandmother did, but I find squeezing it in much easier. But either way, we'll go ahead and stuff 12 of those and place those in our pan. And as you're about to see, because of the size, I'm not able to get two neat rows of six on each side. So I'm gonna have to angle these a little bit to make it work. Or I guess if we wanted, we could do some in one direction and then some the other, but somehow, some way, try to fit 12 in the best you can. Oh, and in case they're watching, which they're not, the company that makes these pasta tubes should make and sell a pan where 12 fit perfectly in two neat rows. Okay, can we get someone on that? And after that, we can figure out the hot dogs to hot dog bun package thing. Oh, and just in case more than two break and you're forced to try to stuff a broken one, just do it like this. All right, simply tear it completely open and then pipe in the appropriate amount of filling and then just roll it all back together with the seam on the bottom and nobody will be the wiser. And to prove that, I'm going to secretly place this in the pan and you'll see once these are done, you will not be able to know which one that is. And no, it was not that one. And then what we'll do once our pan is filled is go ahead and ladle in enough sauce just to barely cover. And as I mentioned earlier, I really like to bake these in the sauce, right? Some people don't use any sauce at all and just sauce them once they're done. But personally, I much more enjoy a smothered, very wet manicotti. But again, suit yourself and feel free to put in as much or as little sauce as you want. And then before these are baked, I'm gonna go ahead and sprinkle over some more freshly grated Parmesan. And yes, I used to use melty cheeses like mozzarella or provolone, but that can kind of fuse together into a tough layer on top. So these days I prefer to do the much easier to cut through Parmesan. 
And that's it. This is now ready to transfer into the upper center of a 375 degree oven for about 25 to 30 minutes or until it looks like this. Oh yeah, that looks good. Except that we had to angle them and they are not in two neat rows, which really doesn't bother me, but it will bother some people a lot. And you know who you are. And then besides very, very carefully cleaning off the edges with a barely, barely damp towel. All right, be careful. Don't burn yourself. But besides that minor cleanup, I also think we should let these sit for about 10 minutes before we serve them, all right, just so that cheese filling can tighten up a little bit. And while we wait, we can go ahead and garnish this with some freshly chopped Italian parsley, since this is, after all, an Italian-American dish, and that is one of the rules. Oh, and can you tell which one is the broken one? No, I didn't think so. But anyway, let's go ahead and serve two of these up, along with, of course, some of our secret sausage sauce. And yes, of course we could have put that sausage in the filling, but I didn't want sausage in my manicotti. I wanted it around my manicotti. And then we will finish this in a very predictable way by grating over a little more Parmesan and maybe add in another pinch of parsley, which I think is nice, especially if you have to take some contractually obligated pictures, which I do and I did. And then I grabbed a spoon and dug in. And that, my friends, as I mentioned in the intro, is a perfect culinary compromise. All right, on one hand, we're enjoying rich, decadent, cheesy, saucy Italian comfort food, but we are also at the same time getting a decent amount of broccoli, which as far as a ratio goes, I thought was the perfect amount. All right, if you put too little, then why bother? But we also don't want to use so much that we ruin this. So not to sound immodest, but I think this is the perfect formula, especially when everything's elevated by that little bit of secret sausage we snuck in. And as far as being frugal goes, we got away using one single Italian sausage, and it was enough to flavor this entire pan. So like I said, it is optional, but if you're feeding a bunch of meat lovers, it is a very economical way to make them happy. And yes, like many similar dishes, this will actually be better the next day, so try if you can to have leftovers. Although because of the broccoli content, on behalf of everybody that works at the same office you do, we would like you not to reheat this in the office break room microwave. Right, that is just not considerate. Which reminds me, this is also delicious cold. But whether you have leftovers or not, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Chicken and broccoli curry. That's right, there are a handful of basic fundamental recipes that anyone that really wants to learn how to cook has to master. And that's because the same basic technique's gonna work no matter what meats and vegetables and spices you use. And it's learning to make dishes like this that allows you to go from someone that knows how to follow a recipe to someone that actually creates recipes, which is not only way more enjoyable, it also pays a lot better. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by mixing up our curry spice blend. And this time we'll be going with some ground cumin some ground coriander, some paprika, and you can use either regular or smoked. Okay, dealer's choice. We will also toss in some turmeric, as well as some freshly ground black pepper, and then of course some salt. And then we will finish up with our good old friend cayenne pepper. And that's it, we'll go ahead and take a spoon and give this a mix. And depending on exactly what we're gonna include in our curry, we may wanna include some other or different spices here. But generally, we are gonna to wanna to start this process by mixing up some sort of dry spice blend. And then what we'll do once that is mixed up is go ahead and apply about half of it to whatever meat we're gonna use in our curry, which for me this time is gonna be a couple large boneless skinless chicken breasts. And we'll take about 50% of our mixture and apply it very generously to both sides. And yes, of course, if you wanted to use boneless skinless chicken thighs, you could use those instead. And there's basically two approaches to this step. Okay, we could if we wanna cut our meat into smaller pieces, and then toss it with these spices, which is probably what I would do if I was using thighs. But since we're using breast here, I prefer this approach where we coat the whole thing, and then what we'll do is sear this and partially cook it, and then cut up the meat. And that way I think we have much less chance of this drying out. And then time permitting, once these spices have been applied, I like to wrap this up and pop in the fridge for a few hours to give that meat plenty of time to absorb all those flavors. But having said that, if you do want this a little quicker, you could skip this step and just start cooking. Right, that's up to you. I mean, you are after all the Anne Murray of making curry in a hurry. But personally, I do like to let mine sit in the fridge for at least a few hours. 
And while we're waiting for that, we might as well go ahead and prep our broccoli, which I like to start by cutting the florets off the stems. For the very simple reason that those cook a lot faster, so by separating them at this point, we'll be able to add those at different times during the cooking process, and hopefully end up with a much more consistent final product. And what we'll do for the much more fibrous, tougher stem parts, is go ahead and slice those lengthwise into some kind of semi-uniform strips, at which point we can then turn those, and then slice them across like this, into whatever size pieces you want. And as usual, the exact size of these pieces really doesn't matter, as long as they're fairly consistent. So pick a size and stick with it. And then as far as the tops go, I like to cut down straight through the piece of stem that's holding that head together, so we can divide those into a little more bite-sized pieces. So I went ahead and did that to about a pound of broccoli total, and then transfer that into two bowls. And then assuming our chicken is sat spiced in the fridge long enough, we'll go ahead and pull that out and cook it in some butter set over medium high heat, but not all the way. Okay, we're only gonna do this for about three minutes per side, just so it cooks about halfway through. Since once we have this cut up, we are gonna toss this back in our curry to finish cooking. Okay, so we're basically just searing on some of the spices and firming up these breasts a little bit so we can get a nice clean cut. Not to mention starting to develop the flavors in this pan. So once those are set, we'll turn off the heat and we'll transfer those onto a plate and we'll let those sit until they're cool enough to handle. And then while those are resting, we will head back to the stove to build our curry sauce, which we'll start by turning our heat back on to medium high. And we will sizzle some crushed garlic in that hot butter for about 30 seconds or so before stirring in the rest of our curry spice mix. And we'll toast all that in that hot butter for another 30 seconds or so, which is really gonna help bring out a lot of flavor. Okay, this is one of the secrets to making a decent curry. We always wanna briefly toast those in the pan before adding our liquids. So that's what we'll do before adding in one can of coconut milk. All right, the full fat kind. Do not use the low fat coconut milk. We're gonna need that fat. I'm also, believe it or not, gonna to toss in a little bit of ketchup, or as we call it in the world of curries, tomato chutney. And we'll go ahead and stir all that together, making sure we're rubbing all that delicious goodness off the bottom. And we will wait for this to come up to a simmer. And once it does, I like to turn it down to medium and let it cook for about 10 minutes. And then just so it doesn't reduce down too far, I also decided to throw in a splash of chicken broth. Or if times are tough, you could just use a splash of water. And we'll stir that in. And like I said, we'll let that simmer for about 10 minutes. After which, if everything's gone according to plan, it should look something like this. And then what we'll do once our curry sauce is set is go ahead and toss in our broccoli stems and we'll give those a stir, and we will cook them until they're almost but not quite tender, which I would love to tell you how long that's gonna take, but I can't because I don't know how big you cut those. But you'll know, because after about five minutes, you'll go ahead and test them. And what we can do while those are cooking, if you're into multitasking, is go ahead and cube up our partially cooked chicken breast, which I'm gonna do by cutting into about half inch strips, and then turning and cutting into about half inch cubes. And because these were partially cooked, this is only gonna need a few minutes in that hot sauce to finish cooking perfectly. So we'll go ahead and cut up that chicken as shown, and then we'll head back to the stove, and assuming our broccoli stems are just about tender, we'll go ahead and add the tops, and we'll sort of poke those down a little bit until they're evenly distributed, at which point we'll cover this, and we'll let that cook for about three or four minutes until those are almost tender. And again, I can't give you times. All right, you gotta check yourself before you wreck yourself. And by self, I mean broccoli. And once you've determined that it's almost tender, we will go ahead and stir in our chicken and let it cook for maybe two or three more minutes or until that chicken is just cooked through. Oh, and I should mention, if you are using thighs here, you probably want to add those to the pan when you add the broccoli stems, since those will take a little bit longer to cook than this breast meat. And that's it. Once everything's cooked to our liking, we are pretty much down to just checking this for seasoning. And if necessary, maybe stirring in a little more salt. Oh, and by the way, if you want bright green, still firm broccoli in this, feel free. It will definitely look better, but in my opinion, it will not taste better. Okay, I don't want it mushy and falling apart, but I do want my broccoli cooked very, very tender, which I believe is gonna give it a better, less bitter, sweeter flavor. But of course, suit yourself. And that's it, once we've tasted and adjusted the seasonings, we'll go ahead and serve that up on some rice, with of course, plenty of that amazing flavorful sauce. And I went ahead and finished up with some freshly sliced green onions. Oh, and besides the fact that you can do this with all kinds of different meat and vegetables and spices, you can also, instead of putting this on rice, use it on noodles or french fries for like a curry version of poutine. Oh yeah, I think Anne-Marie would have liked that. 
And that's it. One of my all-time favorite curries was done and ready to enjoy. And because coconut milk has that rich, subtly sweet flavor, it just works so well with those big, bold, aromatic spices we use. And as I touched on earlier, while this would work with any combination of meat and vegetables, chicken and broccoli is a wonderful combination and one of my favorite pairings for a simple curry like this. And I know the food stylists aren't happy, but I make no apologies for fully cooking this broccoli. Okay, for me, a dish like this is classic comfort food. And when I think comfort food, I do not think about biting into still crunchy broccoli. But again, that's just personal preference. And if you want, you could just add that broccoli with the chicken and just cook it for a couple minutes at the end. But anyway, that's it. How to make a very simple coconut milk based curry. With a few minor tweaks, this exact same technique will work with any kind of meat and vegetables. And the more you make this trying different things, it becomes less a recipe and more just something delicious you make to eat. Which is not the only reason, but it is the main reason. I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. broccoli salad. So simple, so refreshing, so delicious. And I hear, although I'm no expert, I hear it's good for you. So here's how I put this together. We're going to take a pound and a half of fresh broccoli. I like to cut just a little end off there. Usually it's kind of a little dry and ugly. We're going to cut the stem in quarters. And then very important, when you cut the tops of broccoli, turn it this way and go right down the middle and then in quarters. Don't worry what the tops look like. You got to get the stems even because that's what you need to cook evenly. So there we go. So it's all separated. Like I said, the stems you want sort of uniform. The tops does not matter. We're going to take a large pot of boiling salted water, and I'm going to boil those for about five to six minutes. Results may vary. All right, so you got to kind of play it by ear. Take a little paring knife. When the stem are just starting to get tender, there's still a little resistance there. They're not soft. They're still just a little bit firm. We're going to take those out, put them in some very cold water. I don't waste my ice when I do blanched vegetables. Very cold water works in a restaurant with an ice machine. Sure, go ahead, throw a scoop of ice in there. But at home, save the ice for the cocktails. All right, when we drain these, we're going to put the flour side down so the water runs out. If you just put them any old way, those heads are kind of like sponges. They really trap the water. So I like to drain them like that. Set that aside. Make sure they drain at least a half hour. The dressing, so simple. Lots of garlic, fresh lemon juice, rice vinegar, some salt, a little bit of pepper. I know what you think's coming next. Cayenne, wrong. Red chili flakes. A little bit of Dijon. We're going to whisk that up, and then we're going to drizzle in some olive oil. All the amounts will be on the site. Make sure you get those critical measurements. Okay, you're going to whisk in your oil, and you're going to have a beautiful emulsified dressing. You know the drill. Very slow at first. Once it starts to come together and thickens, then you can add a little quicker. My broccoli is drained. Very well drained. Wet broccoli, no good. We're going to toss that with our dressing. Now here's the trick. The florets really will soak up that dressing. So you want to make sure it's all evenly mixed. So I give it a toss. I let it sit for five minutes, and then I toss it again. Now, it's perfect to serve like this. In fact, it's beautiful served like this. Or you can refrigerate for up to half hour, hour max. Otherwise, it starts to break down. This is not something you want to marinate and you know leave in the fridge forever. So toss it relatively close to when you're going to eat, and you will be happy. I kind of put my florets around in a little circle. I put the stems in the middle. That's my presentation. Get your own, or use mine. You'll notice I'm in the window here. The sun was going in and out of the clouds, so that's why... Uh, you get that light effect here. It's all part of the show. I like to finish with a little red chili flake. And there you go. Cold broccoli salad with a spicy lemon garlic dressing. Incredibly simple, amazing side dish for all your summer barbecues or cookouts or whatever. I hope you give that a try. All the ingredients are on the site. And as always, enjoy. Broccoli, garlic, angel hair pasta. This is kind of like the cauliflower alioli I did, only with broccoli. And uh, it's really delicious, really healthy. So take some broccoli, some garlic, lots of garlic, olive oil butter, red pepper flakes. And what we're going to do 
is separate the broccoli. All right, this is the key to this recipe. So take a nice sharp knife and just shave the nice bright green flowers off the top. Don't worry about getting them too small. Just shave them right off into a bowl. And then the stems, all right, or the branches, you're going to just chop up into small pieces. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to make a sauce out of the stems, and then we're going to throw the tops in at the end so they stay kind of green and not so falling apart. And you'll see, it's all going to work. So now you can chop this as small as you want. You want them at least like quarter inch, eighth inch pieces. So keep chopping and keep chopping, but eventually you lose patience. And you say, you know what, that's good enough. Throw it in a bowl. There's all your shaved tops. And now we start the sauce, which could not be easier. Olive oil and butter on medium heat. Throw in your massive amount of garlic. And just give that a swirl in the butter and oil. And when it starts to sizzle, throw in your red pepper flakes and have your chicken stock ready because we are not going to brown this garlic. You know what I always say about browning the garlic? It'll wreck it. So as soon as that starts to sizzle, three seconds later, throw in the chicken stock. Okay? That's going to stop the garlic from cooking or overcooking. You're going to add your broccoli stems and or branch pieces. And then we're going to simmer that on medium heat until they're tender, which is going to take about 10 minutes. Okay? maybe 12 minutes. So you want to keep that liquid level about what you see right there. If you see it getting too dry, just add a little water. Okay, and keep drizzling in water or stock until that level just kind of stays constant. Because we got to have enough liquid to cook these broccoli tops. So when the bottoms are very soft and tender, throw in the tops. And those are only going to take about three or four minutes to cook through. Which works out perfectly for us because the angel hair pasta we're using only takes three or four minutes to cook through. Now normally it takes about five minutes, but I like to cook it a minute under because what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that delicious garlic, broccoli, olive oil, butter sauce, not to mention red pepper flakes, and I'm going to pour it over the pasta and finish cooking that last minute in with the pasta. You know my pasta trick. So there's my one minute undercooked angel hair pasta. I cooked it for four minutes set five in the package, pour my sauce over, which is basically our sauce now. All right, so pour our sauce over, give it a stir with a wooden spoon, throw in a big old handful of Reggiano Parmesan, that's kind of like the you know, glue of the pasta sauce. We're gonna give it a little toss, and then any liquid that's left, which there's a good amount, is gonna just be sucked up and soaked into that beautiful angel hair it's going to absorb for that last minute of cooking all those wonderful flavors. I mean, the smell on this is unbelievable. What we're going to do is we're going to throw on the lid and just let it sit for two minutes. Okay? Now, spaghetti, I kind of usually leave about five minutes, but angel hair is a lot thinner. Two minutes later, put it in a bowl. I'm going to grate over some more fresh cheese. By the way, this is an inside joke with some chefs from about ten years ago. There was like a trend where cheese, spices, cocoa, powdered sugar... We had to sprinkle it on the edges of the plate. It was really funny. It lasted for about two weeks. The waiters complained that they kept putting their thumbs in the food. But anyway, a little uh, inside kitchen humor there. There is our beautiful broccoli angel hair with garlic, red pepper flakes on top to garnish. So healthy, so delicious, so aromatic. You gotta eat your broccoli. This is a great way to do it. Go to the site, get all the ingredients, and read the post while you're there, and uh, enjoy. Roasted Roman style Romanesco. That's right, I was gonna start with a joke about this being a vegetable brought to earth by aliens. But these days, if I did, 30 to 40% of the country would believe me. So instead, I will just say it looks like a vegetable brought to earth by aliens. And because of its bizarre and unusual appearance, this is the kind of thing people pass over in the market, mostly because they're confused by it and not sure quite what to do with it. Well, stay tuned because I'm gonna show you exactly what to do with it. And if you do what I do, you're going to be enjoying one of the most delicious vegetables you've ever had. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with how to prep Romanesco. And the first thing I do is usually remove any of these tough stems and leaves from the outside, which you can do by pulling off, although it's probably easier if we just cut those off when we portion this. And to do that, what we'll attempt to do is cut this directly through the center into two pieces. And then, like I said, we can use our knife to trim off any of those tough stems on the outside. 
And then if we wanted, we could roast these just like this. But because that core in the center is so large and thick, I think this cooks a lot more evenly if we actually cut these again into quarters. But make sure you know exactly where that core is, so you're cutting right through the center of it. And that's it. Once we have our Romanesco heads broken down into quarters, we will simply set those aside while we mix up a very simple dressing with which we're going to coat these with before we roast them. And that's going to start with a few olive oil packed anchovy fillets, to which we will add some olive oil. And then what we'll do is take the back of a fork and give these a little bit of a mashing. Which if you want, you can leave kind of coarse like I'm going to. Or if you're afraid of people seeing you put anchovies in something they're about to eat, you could smash this down all the way to a paste. So you decide. I mean, you are after all the Johnny Cash of how fine to mash. And speaking of rings of fire, once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and add some red pepper flakes, as well as some freshly squeezed lemon juice. And then what we'll do once we have everything in the bowl is give that a quick mix with our fork to create a temporary emulsification, at which point we'll stop and add our cut up Romanesco and then we'll take a couple clean hands and we'll get in there and we'll get in there deep. And we will toss these until they are completely and utterly coated with that dressing. And then what we'll do once we're 110% sure those pieces have been 100% coated is that we'll stop and sprinkle over some plain breadcrumbs, as well as a very generous grating of real Parmesan cheese. All right, out of all the recipes you could get away with using fake Parmesan, this is not one of them. So go get yourself a nice chunk of Parmigiano Reggiano and do this right. Oh, and by the way, because our anchovies are salty, and we're going to use a good amount of Parmesan here, I did not add any salt at this point. But if you want to add a little bit, go ahead. Although we can always add a little more when we're eating, and it's impossible to take some out. But anyway, once that's been crumbed in cheese, we'll go ahead and give that a toss. At which point it's ready to transfer into some kind of roasting pan. Into which we've drizzled a generous amount of olive oil. And we'll go ahead and place those in fun side up. And then once those have been placed in, we'll make sure to scrape out any of those cheesy crumbs in the bowl and sort of scatter those evenly over the top, since all that stuff's going to brown up and crisp up beautifully as this roasts. Speaking of which, to hedge our bets, once that's done, we'll go ahead and grate some more Parmesan over the top. And please don't be shy. And then for one last touch, we'll go ahead and drizzle these with olive oil, at which point it's ready to transfer into the center of a 475 degree oven for about 20 minutes or so or until everything is beautifully browned and looking incredibly gorgeous. And more importantly, our Romanesco is tender. But you can't see tender. You can only feel tender. So we'll go ahead and give that the old, old polka polka with a knife. And I confirm that mine was in fact perfectly tender, which means it's ready to serve, which I decided to do garnish with some little lemon wedges, plus one last drizzle with olive oil. Except if you place the lemon down first and then drizzle the oil over the top, you're going to end up with what we call in the business, slippery lemon. So it's probably a much better idea to do your olive oil first and then garnish with your lemon wedges. All right, I make these mistakes so you don't have to. But anyway, once incorrectly garnished, I went ahead and grabbed a fork and knife and dug in. And that, my friends, bizarre appearances aside, is one of the most delicious vegetables you will ever taste. And I know it does look like it's going to taste like a cross between cauliflower and broccoli, which it sort of does. But at the same time, it really does have a unique flavor all its own. Okay, it's kind of sweet and nutty, and definitely milder and not quite as bitter as broccoli. But to summarize, what it really tastes like is Romanesco. And while it is quite delicious just roasted like this, it's also very, very nice with a little squeeze of slippery lemon. So this really is a beautiful way to serve it. But my favorite way, and why I didn't put any garlic in the dressing, would be served next to a beautiful garlic aioli. And yes, that is redundant. And while it would be perfectly acceptable to serve this as a side dish, I really do think served like this, it's more than special enough to serve on its own. So I just went ahead and turned it into an entree. And why something like this works so well with aioli, and also why we use so much olive oil, is because the fatal flaw with the vegetables is they don't have any fat content. So by simply enjoying them with some flavorful fatty ingredients, we make up for that. And it really does help bring out and enhance all their natural goodness. Especially something like this Romanesco, which is surprisingly savory, and certainly more than worthy to be eaten with a fork and steak knife. And if you're thinking he sounds kind of overly excited for eating a roasted vegetable, well then, I'm guessing you've never had roasted Roman-style Romanesco, because this stuff really is fantastic. So the next time you're at the market, sometime between late summer and early fall, and you see this gorgeous but bizarre looking vegetable that may or may not have been brought to this planet by aliens, I really do hope you pick some up and give this a try soon. 
So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.